something's missing. I'm not yet ready to conclude this series on emerging adults with mental illness. In the last episode, I'll dive for pearls in the 15 episodes published over the past 10 months. But what's nagging at me? Each guest spoke from the culture that they knew and cultures in which they received or offered treatment and service. I need an episode specifically about how people can approach, be curious about, be open to the cultures they experience. Is this cultural competence or sensitivity or what? I sought experts working with a kaleidoscope of cultures. First, Jamila Zibel, a previous guest and community health worker with the Cambridge Health Alliance. Jamila blows my socks off whenever I speak with her. Next, my friend and previous guest, Kiami Mahania, referred me to Catherine Smale, PhD, a psychologist at the Lynn Community Center. Kat is a clinical therapist and the Associate Director of Training for Behavioral Health. Erica Malik at the Innovation and Value Initiative referred me to Teresa Nguyen, PhD, with a social work background at Mental Health America. Teresa primarily does research and runs their screening program of youth coming onto the internet, solving problems for the first time in their lives. Hang on, here we go. I learned a ton. Welcome to Health Hats, the podcast. I'm Danny Van Loon, a two-legged, cisgender, old white man of privilege who knows a little bit about a lot of health care and a lot about very little. You will listen and learn about what it takes to adjust to life's realities and the awesome surface of health care. Let's make some sense of all of this. Like what you're reading? hearing or watching, go to my webpage, health-hats.com slash support to choose a method of support that suits you. Thank you. Let's discuss cultural competence, sensitivity, and humility. How do cultural humility, sensitivity, and competence come into the team sport of best health? We're going to dwell here for a bit, hearing all three guests speak in depth. We're hearing Kat's mail first. Cultural competence came about in the 80s, really as a first attempt to start really grappling in a new way with the disparate health outcomes that providers were seeing in their immigrant populations and trying to understand why that was happening and how they could improve care in order to be able to address those okay. issues. And so cultural competence is really about becoming aware of your own, like who you are and where you fit in, within your own culture. It's also about fact finding, about knowing the history of a culture that's different from yours, knowing um, important customs, things like that. One of the challenges is that when you get to medicine or when you get to a doctoral level of education, society really expects you to adopt this position of knowing, of being an expert. And cultural humility really calls for us to do the opposite and to approach people in a way that feels more squidgy, right? Like we don't get to walk into the room and be the expert that we train to be. And that can feel really hard and really challenging. It's Um, a lot of tension. Yeah, it is. It's a lot to hold. It's a lot to hold. So you're not excluding or uh, cultural competence. What you're saying is it's not sufficient. Correct. Because the problem with cultural competence is that it can cause harm. Because if you're just taking a bird's eye view of a population and then applying that to all of the people that um, are in that 
promote stereotypes, and that's the harm yeah. in it. Okay, um, okay. So it's a, it's a starting place, but it's not a place to rest. We're hearing Teresa Nguyen next. As a clinician, I've been trained to be a clinician. I have trained others as, a, as clinicians to be clinicians. And so you have your books. You have what the theory says and what the book says. And the book says cultural sensitivity is about learning about other cultures and being prepared to address your bias and to be aware of those issues. And I think that's true. I don't think it really lends to, as a person, how I'm supposed to take these words and apply them into a relationship. But I think if you think about this in a different context, like, we are all human beings, and I could be your friend, Danny. <laughs> if I took the time to be your friend, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter that I'm Vietnamese and you're Danny, I think when we come together and we want to be genuine and we want to be friends together, that each of us takes a, a, a position of curiosity and love and support and kindness, right? And I think that's probably the number one requirement for good cultural sensitivity. It takes sensitivity in general at, because how I define my culture is one tiny piece of the pie of who makes up myself, like me, Teresa. I don't even represent Vietnamese people. I represent a halfway generation immigrant person who grew who was born in America. And maybe that's all I can speak to. I can't even say that I would want a Vietnamese therapist per se because they would somehow understand my culture because they might not understand my family dynamics. Mm -hmm. Are there things that they would share that would be easier? Yeah. I've had some therapists who come off pretty strong off the bat with saying things like, it sounds like you are X, Y, or Z. And to my brain, I'm like, that may be true, but it sounds especially harsh in the context of my family dynamic. I can't abandon my family and just set boundaries and say, screw you all. Like, you've hurt me, so I'm going to cut you off. If it was that easy, I don't think I'd be in therapy. Mm -hmm. And it's not just my culture that I come from a communal culture and that I come from an immigrant culture. So my family only had each other. They didn't have anybody else. There's so many things that go into understanding those dynamics that if a therapist is curious and explores, that sets the relationship up, I think, in a good footing to help people understand how my culture, understand how my family dynamics influence my decisions. And then you as a clinician, as a curious guider, can help me build insight and then develop boundaries. Does that make sense? Next is Jamila Zibel. I am not a mental health professional. Right. I'm a community health professional. And I, I work with this concept of cultural humility because for me, it works every single time. Okay. Cultural humility, and this is a, a concept developed by two Black women in the early 90s when there were lots of racial tensions, and I feel like they, it's still here, right? It feels 30 years later, and we still have the same issues going on. But Dr. Jan Moray Garcia and Dr. Melanie Turvalon, and I was privileged enough to be trained by Dr. Turvalon, inspired by what she said. And when you were talking about culture and how that impacts the way you treat people for different conditions, healthcare, I feel, is the only product that cannot be delivered alone by a healthcare professional. It right. needs to have the involvement of the person that is receiving it. Because let's say you go to your doctor and say, I have this horrible headache. I... Uh, can't get out of bed most days. And the doctor says, oh, here, take this pill. Gives you the prescription and you go home and you look at that. And perhaps you didn't have the courage to say, oh, what is that for? What is it going to do for me? And, 
and the doctor didn't give you that space either. Or I'm talking about doctor, but it could be a nurse, could be a primary, any a physician assistant or another provider. If that person does not understand what the plan is, does not buy into the plan, it will be a lost appointment. Do you have any questions? And how? what do I need to know to treat you? Well, you need to know that if you tell me that I'm depressed, I might be looking for my religious leader or I might take herbal tea or I don't like pills. When you talk about cultural humility, is that humility to understand the other person in front of you from what they tell you they are and they need, right? Because you can be the all-powerful provider and tell you what's good for you and tell you what, you know, what you can do to treat yourself, or you can say, let's do this together. Tell me. Right. What do I need to know about you to treat you? So cultural humility is a little bit different than a previous concept of cultural competence. And there was a time everybody was trying to learn everything there is about you, Danny, all your characteristics, so that once I know it, I can do help you. You are not one person that is going to be the same person forever. And maybe I can understand one part of you, but you are a multidimensional human being. For example, you look at me, I was born in Brazil. I'm a white Latina cisgender with roots in many different countries. I'm Middle Eastern, Mexican. And you might come to me and say, oh, you're Brazilian. You might ask feijoada you might like to go to the beach you might because that's what brazilians like but brazilians can be from the north south or center they can be people of color they can be straight or gay they can be a number of things and every single aspect of that person every dimension of that person will make that person unique yeah. So cultural humility is the humility to listen and understand and try to see what you are for, regardless of that list of traits. Okay, chat, right. I know this about you. I know that about you. So I feel like when you stop and listen to people in the health field, like in my role, I'm a health educator and I cannot in any circumstance to go out there and tell people what's going to be good or what kind of lifestyle is going to be good for their health without having that discussion. And is this something that you are interested in discussing with me and let's go from there. Otherwise, people might sit there and listen to everything I have to say and it's not important to them. Kat Smail next. And it's different from cultural competence because it occupies more of a stance. So it goes beyond sort of education about the nuts and bolts and really is about occupying the stance of not knowing. So when you have an individual who's presenting with illness, it's important not just to see them as somebody who is occupying a certain space within a culture but it's really important to be able to see them within their many contexts, right? Where That's where the word intersectional comes in, that we're mm -hmm. at this intersection where our ability to be able-bodied or our race or our age or our gender expression, like all of those things come together to create an individual. And so the idea of cultural humility is that you stand in that place of not knowing and you're able to present yourself and treatment and ask questions so that the patient can inform you about who you are or who they are. And then you're able to better treatment plan with them and offer them services and in a more individualistic way, in a way that's going to be more successful for them. Humility and getting it wrong are inexorably linked. I have so many stories about getting it wrong. My embarrassment, mortification, and if I'm lucky, humor. I've made some kind, warm, lasting friends getting it wrong. So is, that sounds like curiosity. Mm -hmm. You're curious. Yes, definitely. I think what you're talking about is such an important skill, right? That um, 
I would say at least 50% of this work and cultural humility is being able to be wrong and to mess up with a little bit of grace. Humor. <laughs> and you, you build that. Yeah, yeah. You build that thicker skin over time mm. and realizing that, wow, like you've said, I've been wrong half the time. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm a bad person. It just means that I'm trying and I'm able to incorporate that new information and do a little bit better next time. So you have to be able to hold both. I need to make progress, but also I'm going to mess it up along the way. I'm trying to get at is this issue of having enough self-confidence to try to listen and then enough self-confidence to be able to accept, oh, I read that wrong. So I also think that it seems like this humility is a two-way street because sometimes people are forgiving. Sometimes people mm -hmm. are offended. Sometimes people don't say anything and you have no idea that you stepped in it and they've shut down you may get a sense that something changed here mm -hmm. and oh my goodness did i just say something cuz the temperature in the room just dropped like 20 degrees again it's two there's two sides to it mm -hmm. and people who are and so anyway i'm grateful when the other person is has the confidence to call me on it and straighten me out. But I don't expect it because I'm with them because they feel like crap. And when you feel like crap, you're not really on top of your game, right? You're not necessarily sensitive yourself, Jim Elizabeth again. So I think what you're talking about okay. is one of the key principles of cultural humility, which is a lifelong process of critical self-reflection and self-critique. Okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and right. that means you're always thinking about what do I bring to the table? What am I bringing into this relationship with my client or patient or friend or family member? Hey. And in your case, you brought your bias there. Right. That person would be him, he, she, her, right? Yeah. So that self-reflection. So you, you, we all have biases. Right. And it's okay. That's how we are brought up and we learn certain things and we see life and we see the world with those lenses. The problem is when we are not aware of those biases and we allow them to have a negative impact in the work that we do with our patients and clients. So that's one of the principles. And in that principle, you are looking at how dynamic you as a human being are. And with the changes in experience, it's like you had that experience, right? Mm -hmm. And next time, that will impact the way you're going to oh, yeah. treat that person who opened the door. So you changed. You're changing daily. Okay. And the person in front of you is also changing daily. I need help to keep creating without impacting our retirement funds. I've expanded my podcast this year to include video, and costs and time needed have surged. Although my queue of episodes ready to produce grows, I can only manage monthly episodes. I need to further build my production team. You can help. Visit health-hats.com slash support for ways to contribute. Choose monthly subscriptions with bonus content, Zoom meetings with me and others, personal Barry Sachs MP3s, coaching sessions, and more. Occasional donations are always welcome. And you can still subscribe for free to enjoy bonus episodes. You can also recommend us through email, social media, or postcard. Postage on us. Visit health 
hats.com slash support. Your support is deeply appreciated. Thank you. You're, so you're not interacting with a statue. You're not, yeah, you're not interacting with somebody that has certain traits because of where they were born or because of their sexual orientation or because of their social standing. So it's a person that is always changing with experiences. I need help to keep creating without impacting our retirement funds. I've expanded my podcast this year to include video, and costs and time needed have surged. Although my queue of episodes ready to produce grows, I can only manage monthly episodes. I need to further build my production team. You can help. Visit health dash hats.com slash support for ways to contribute. Choose monthly subscriptions with bonus content, Zoom meetings with me and others, personal Barry Sachs MP3s, coaching sessions, and more. Occasional donations are always welcome. And you can still subscribe for free to enjoy bonus episodes. You can also recommend us through email, social media, or postcard. Postage on us. Visit health-hats.com slash support. Your support is deeply appreciated. Thank you. The second very important principle of cultural humility, Danny, is redressing the power imbalance in this patient provider dynamic yes, yes, because yes. when i tell you as a provider of service as a provider of health services or like in my case in in a community setting when i tell you that i know what's good for you and here you go and take it i'm the all powerful here i'm not doing anything to redress that power imbalance and so it's very important that you involve the person on decisions that is that they will need to do follow up on. And the third principle there is developing mutual mutually beneficial partnerships with communities on behalf of individuals and defined populations and that's something that I do all the time. Yeah. And many times we are tempted to say Oh my gosh, I read all of this and I know everything about community processes. I know everything about the way people's lives. And you have all this frame of reference that you bring with you. And I see that happening all the time with wonderfully intentioned individuals. I'm here and I want to help. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the folks that are concerned about equity, they come in with all these theories and wonderful <laughs> knowledge that they develop when the most important thing is when they look at, in my case, I look at communities that are, that have been historically broken, disadvantaged and lacking resources. And many of the networks don't function. Many of the, the institutions that could be helping them who are pressed for resources and it's not working. So what you look at them is chaotic and you yes. try to apply all your book smarts right. on that instead of developing a partnership to say, okay, so what's going on here and how can we together figure out what the solutions are? I wanted to bring the discussions back to emerging adults with mental illness. Each guest had a nuanced perspective. Emerging adults go through this process of rejecting everything and then adopting what's theirs and then moving forward as themselves in an ideal situation. So... How does this, so it seems to me like this cultural sensitivity or cultural humility is a moving target. It's not static. 
it's yeah. dynamic. We're both changing over that time. And when somebody's an emerging adult, that changing might be even more accelerated. Yeah. So not only are they dealing with their culture, their preferences, their situation, but also going through a transition. Teresa Nguyen next. I would argue, too, that something's interesting about mental health or maybe human beings in general is that sometimes I don't even know the answer. So when you say that we're rejecting something, it's like, I don't even know what I'm rejecting. Am I rejecting myself? Am I rejecting what my parents told me? And that's an exciting thing about adolescent phase is the identity formation period is it's, it can be fun and it pa- and painful, mm-hmm. and 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 that's why it moves. It, it's because you don't have the solid footing of knowing thyself. Yeah, and and when I do know myself, then I may be less inclined to change. But when I'm young, I'm rejecting because I'm trying to just make sense of what's going to stick. Does this feel right or does it not feel right? And I don't have the muscle memory for how to make it even stick and feel right. Because once I adopt an identity, I have to go test it out. I'm going to go play and be this person and see if it causes me more suffering, more bullying. And that all happens during the adolescent phase. I think that it's important to consider in the cultural framework, that's the dynamic. So when you see shifts and as a therapist, you're not assigning this to rejection per se, that this is part of that journey. And then the question is what matters to you? Because if I say, okay, I'm forming myself, that might tell us where that young person is in that formation process. Because A young person might say, oh, my culture is important to me. My family is important to me. But they also might just say, I don't know, being young is important to me or basketball is important to me or eating two cheeseburgers a day. Who knows, right? Like, I love ice cream. So I I think that if you think about culture and formation of culture in in too strict of a format, I think you end up missing some of the stuff, Mm -hmm. the stuff that helps guide a young person to identifying who they are and where they land to become who they are. And that's where a person-centered approach to cultural identity or even identity as a whole uncouples ourselves from these labels that are required. Mm -hmm. For a long time, my mom was so mad because she was like, you're Vietnamese. And I grew up in Los Angeles. And I would literally say to her, I'm Mexican. (laughs) And I had to understand this growing up in the context of my mother being a Vietnamese immigrant and me being Asian in a predominantly Mexican community and feeling afraid to accept my Vietnamese identity because I wanted to fit in. I wanted yeah. belonging than anything. So I have three kids. Yeah. And I've used cultural humility with them forever. Don't tell them that. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> but one of the things about cultural humility is the listening, yeah. the listening to learn. the listening without judging, the giving the space. And I've been, and I'm telling you, not as a professional, but as a parent, and I've had the best of experiences. And it perhaps have to do with my kids' genes and them being so lovely. And perhaps the fact that they feel, and they verbalize this to me, that they can talk to me without being judged. And during their teenage years, it's difficult and they go through a number of phases. But, and for me, I educated myself to be that non judgmental, good listener. Because sometimes that's all that people need from you that you just sit in front of them. And especially if you are that parent with the power on your favor, right? And when you were there and ge- and providing that space and mm-hmm, wow, oh, I I don't know. People will go through crises and some crises will be worse than others. Right. Some of them will require immediate medical intervention and some of them will require a lot of love and dedication and 
being there on that person's side. In terms of approaching patients with cultural humility who yes. have challenging relationships with parents? Yes. I think probably one of the most important thing that I do as a therapist mm -hmm. um, is to normalize the conflict of young adulthood. Oh, and okay. That, that, I mean, that we are designed biologically to move away from our families in right. adolescence, continuing right. into young adulthood. I often tell people that your adolescence is where you figure out who you're not. And your 20s are about figuring out who you are, mm -hmm. which is an equally challenging task that we talk about a lot less than adolescence. And none of those things do not have to do as much with your family, right? The whole idea is to break away, figure out who you are separately. And then as you get older, you start including more and more of what you learned, right? Either intentionally or not into your relationships and your adulthood but I think really often it's reminding both the young person and their parents that conflict has to happen during this stage of life right that it is really normal and natural and that a lot of times families are able to readjust to the new power dynamics to having a new adult in the family who's able to make their own decisions and are able to keep going forward and find a healthy balance. So yeah, I think normalizing it is really important. And I also think that it's a new, it's a new level of decision making for a young person because they have more power to decide who they engage with and who they don't. And so they have to really reevaluate their relationships and decide who they're going to include going forward. And I think that can be really hard for families in conflict. Because and the, so young those, the contours that that takes differs individually and differs culturally. I'm just saying, I guess I'm making a statement and not really sure I know what I'm talking about. But again, I'm trying to bring this conversation about cultural humility and what that means for me, say, as a clinician, when I'm adding a whole nother dynamic into yeah, the equation. So for example, um, yeah. talking to like broad strokes culturally, it is like very common for an 18-year-old white person to move out of their house and to become independent, whether or not, or half independent, if they're going to mm -hmm. college, right? Um, that is the normative age for that to happen. Mm -hmm. In Latino cultures, you usually stick around in your parents' house for a lot longer. And that is culturally normative, that is healthy and appropriate. And so when you're thinking about what people should and shouldn't be doing at a specific age, young adulthood particularly, those norms are adapted and shifted based on what cultures they're in and what what deciding or helping to determine with the patient what's appropriate and what's not is influenced by culture. And then you have on top of that the individual's experience with their family. So they have right. a high conflict relationship with their parents. Even if they're Latinx, they may be disinclined to stay. Mm -hmm. So you have to view that as an additional lens through which you're understanding the young person. And it's also really important because of the developmental age of young people to understand more fully what aspects of their culture they are either accepting and going with or that they're rejecting. We were talking about the, the, the two way street of it. And you know, <laughs> that, that, uh, but is, that, is that even reasonable to be thinking about that it's a two-way street? That humility is a relationship. And 
the power dynamic of that relationship is totally one-sided. And even though it's nice when the person isn't offended or mm -hmm. doesn't shut down and sometimes they don't say anything and all I know is that the temperature dropped. But is it even useful to think about it as a two-way street or is it that, okay, this is, I'm the clinician, the humility is mine and it's up to me to be sensitive and check things out. The temperature just dropped is just be forgiving yourself of them, of mm -hmm. you, whatever. I don't know if I'm asking a good question. It sounds to me like your question is whether or not humility is only incorporated really within a provider stance or whether or not it's something that's held within the context of relationship. Yes. And the question is both and, right? So yes, okay, because yes. of the power that you mentioned, right, it is largely, it is the onus is on me because I am the person in a position of power, not only as a provider, but also as a white person, as a person from so like middle upper class socioeconomic status. I have a lot of privilege, right? And it's on me, right, to be able to recognize that and to bring a stance of humility. Yeah. That said, right, culture or people's intersectionality is brought by both sides, right? That informs my perspective, and it's also informing my patient's perspective. And for example, I really often work with people from Central and South America because I speak Spanish. And so a lot of that culture is that providers require a differential attitude, right? That they will say, yes, ma'am, to whatever mm -hmm. it is that I am, even if it sounds completely bananas to them. Mm -hmm. But that because of my position as a doctor or as a doctorate, they will say yes. And so it's extra work on my part to help shift that attitude or that belief by providing them opportunities to share and asking mm -hmm. them questions. And it's true mm -hmm. that when we're talking about people who are oppressed, that causes an immeasurable amount of pain. And people who are in pain, especially chronically pain, painful, they have more irritability. They tend to be more depressed. They tend to have much more chronic or challenging mental health symptoms. And all of those things interact or influence the way that we receive challenge, right? Mm -hmm. um, or the way that we rise to greet it or don't. And yes, there are instances when, you know, you've made a mistake or you've made an error and it doesn't seem like a repair is possible. That you've stepped in it and the reaction has gone poorly and no matter what you do or say, right. that won't be heard in the moment. Yeah. And that that's just true. Right. But that doesn't mean that, that our efforts were for nothing. And it doesn't mean that yes. in the future, we can't go back and relook at that. We can't yeah. have this conversation again. Okay. Um, but that makes sense. yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of times the hope is that if we do the right thing, that we'll be rewarded for it. Um, and that just unfortunately isn't the case. And, you know, mm -hmm. we have to keep going despite that. That's interesting because I'm a clinician. So I, a lot of our discussion has come from a, an approach yeah. of clinical care. And as people who yeah. experience yeah. mental health challenges and have to go into therapy or clinical environments to process through our stuff, and I think a lot of the advice so far has been that about how do I shape this? How do I think about this framework, this influence in my life? And how do I approach? How do I approach mental health? Thinking about cultural competency, uh, I would say I think so much has been so much more attention has been played to clinicians on how to be culturally sensitive because I think the system definitely wants to make sure that clinicians don't do more harm when, and that's where we have the control is to train clinicians. 
And so I think that I hope that some of my framework, which we think about being person centered as clinicians that, and a positionality of curiosity, that, that that's going to be a really protective asset for you as a clinician to not do more harm, <laughs> right? And, and to build that therapeutic relationship. But then what I don't necessarily see is the other side with, where coming from MHA and what's important to us is how do I empower? How do I build power from clients, from people? who are the receiving end to enter into therapy or treatment with more power instead of what many of us do where we are passive and we're receivers. And, and I think that when I, we, I've done more work thinking about that question, how do we have more power in the context? And a lot of the answers that come up is don't go into treatment if you could prevent yourself from going into treatment without knowing what you're facing, that's going to help you. You have power. Go into treatment with some things in mind. What do you want to solve? Who are you? Can, do you have a therapist you feel comfortable with confronting as much as you receive? Right? We're often not even told that. It's like, I guess I'm supposed to pick a therapist that's in my network. Right. And that looks and I don't know, sounds like somebody I'd resonate with, but what's my role? Do I get to ask you questions? And increasingly, every time I go to therapy now, I love that I do this. I interview my therapist as much as they interview me. And when I have a therapist who says, I don't feel comfortable sharing those things with you because they've been trained in this format where they're supposed to always reflect something back to you. I'm like, this isn't going to work that's not going to be what builds trust for me. I need a relationship that I can push and ask questions and not feel like you're a weird robot. So I'd really like to talk about kind of some steps that providers could take in order to move along the cultural humility. Please. I don't know. But one thing that I recommend is that if you have a group of people that you are interested in working more effectively with, that you start filling your social media feeds with all different kinds of people who are representative of that group. So if you are interested in working with young people, then start trying to fill your social media feed with all different kinds of young people and seeing the different expressions of their youth that they bring to social media. It's a really mm -hmm. easy way to start educating yourself about a much broader population is by mm -hmm. having more diverse social media feed. Okay. And that yeah. extends to all kinds of media consumption. So if it's, you're going to start watching shows that young people are really interested in, or if you are going to start reading books by people with really different perspectives who are in the population you're interested in. So just really starting trying to get a broader perspective in your day-to-day. -day. And then to really start seeing in yourself what comes up as you're consuming things that are different from your life and your perspective. What comes uh, up? Like, what do you mean? Is this easy for you to accept? Do you understand this perspective? Do you accept it? If you have a young person that is expressing gender fluidity and that's not something you have experience with does that make you squidgy does that are you interested mm -hmm. um, what are the points of acceptance and resistance that you're finding in yourself okay. and then exploring those the more you burrow into culture you find unexpected tunnels encounter unforeseen adventures, and meet varied beings. There are no average tunnels, adventures, or beings, but, but perhaps there is a range. You can feel invigorated if you're at the top of your game and scared and exhausted if you're not. Thankfully, we can't predict the future. If we could, we might lose gifts of humility and humor and the renewed warmth from unforeseen relationships. 
I appreciate the pearls of curiosity when not knowing, reimagining and embracing failure through self-reflection and self-critique, and spending time where your emerging partners congregate. A heartfelt thanks to Kat, Jamila, and Teresa. I couldn't use everything they offered. Editing can be wrenching. Want an in-depth picture of the impact of culture and cultural misalignment? I recommend the book, The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down. A Hmong Child, Her American Doctors, and the Collision of Two Cultures. A 1997 book by Ann Fadiman. A much-quoted section? Dwight Conkergood considered his relationship with the Hmong to be a form of barter, a productive and mutually invigorating dialogue with neither side dominating or winning out. In his opinion, the physicians and nurses at Bonvenet failed to win the cooperation of the camp inhabitants because they considered the relationship one-sided, with the Westerners holding all the knowledge. As long as they persisted in this view, Conquer Good believed that what the medical establishment was offering would continue to be rejected, since the Hmong would view it not as a gift, but as a form of coercion. May the force be with you. I host, write, engineer, and produce Health Hats, the podcast, with assistance from Kayla Nelson and three Van Lewins, Joey, Leon, and Oscar. I play Barry Sachs on some episodes alone or with the Lechuga Fresca Latin Man. I buy my hats at Selma Gundy, Boston. I'm grateful to you who have the critical roles as listeners, readers, and watchers. See the show notes, previous podcasts, and resources through my website, www.health-hats.com and YouTube channel. Please subscribe and contribute. If you like it, share it. See you around the block.